Well, since we're in the way of introductions, we can start with that. Uh, my name is Aaron Richter. I am a senior data scientist at Saturn Cloud, and we'll go in a little bit more uh, who and what Saturn is, but we're a, a vendor that offers um, a um, experience for data science teams uh, in Python, and we particularly specialize in some acceleration with cluster computing and GPU computing using tools like Dask and Rapids. And um, you can email me there with any questions. I think uh, we'll probably try and hold questions to the end, but feel free to reach out uh, on Twitter. Um, Sujit? Uh, yeah, thanks, Aaron. And thanks, uh, all of you in the audience for attending our talk. Uh, my name is Sujit Paul. I work for Elsevier Labs, uh, an advanced technology group within Elsevier. For those of you who don't know, Elsevier is the largest publisher of uh, scholarly content in the world and also provides analytics tools for research management, clinical decision support, and professional education in medicine and nursing. My background is search. Uh, that's how I got my initial start in natural language processing, mostly uh, unsupervised techniques, both statistical and rule-based. And as search moved towards uh, supervised uh, machine learning methods, I moved along with it. And basically that's why I'm here. Uh, in any case, that's me. Back to you, Aaron. Great, awesome. Um, so before we start, it, there's a lot of the contents that we're covering here is kind of stemmed from work that we've done together. And there's a great blog post um, that is kind of talking about a lot of the content. So if you're interested in referencing this later, want to dive deeper a little bit, or we, we go a little too quickly th through some topics, feel free to check out this blog post. And I can share the uh, link to the slides. Uh, when we start the Q&A session, I'll, I'll drop a link to the slides so that way you can download these and you can reference uh, any of the content or any of the links that we're presenting here. Um, but uh, basically the format of how we're gonna talk about, you know, go through this talk is I'm gonna first start off with introducing um, what Dask is and, um, you know, and I'll get into that. And then we'll go into the specific use case of uh, PsySpacey on, on the Cord19 data. So to kind of just set the stage for, for Dask and being a parallel computing platform, I always try to like to take a step back and just talk about like what data scientists are typically doing um, in Python and then why Dask is even something that's necessary. So this is just the kind of standard suite of packages that you might expect if you have some sort of data set and a CSV file, you're probably going to load it with pandas and then do some processing. And if you're gonna do some machine learning, you might use scikit-learn or you might use uh, tools like Spacey, SciSpacey to do kind of your, your NLP type work. And the challenge with these tools and the reason why they might not be fully sufficient for all of the work that we might need to do is that they were built in for, for it's really performance considerations that we're talking about. So like a lot of these tools were built for kind of single core in memory processing. So if you have a CSV file um, and you want to load it into pandas, you have to load the entire file into memory of your computer. So if the file is too big and it doesn't fit into the memory of your laptop or your machine, um, you're kind of stuck. And then if you do get it in, um, processing might be really slow because you're still kind of only using like a single core uh, type thing. And similar similar things happen when you're doing uh, spacey work and, and as you'll see later on. So the reason that um, we were introducing Dask and Dask was critical to this specific project was because it's a parallel computing platform that can kind of extend uh, these tools that you see on the screen and enable them to work with much larger data sets and to do more computing. And so that's really the, the crux of why we're talking about Dask and why Dask was chosen uh, for this particular project. So I'm going to assume that, um, you know, maybe not a lot of the people in this uh, talk have heard, heard of Dask or used it, but if you have, um, that's great. I'm excited that you're here. There's a really great big uh, user base of it. Um, and if you do use Dask, feel free to kind of just drop in the chat what you use it for, um, or, or you kind of, you know, how you feel about it, because, um, you know, like like to spark some of that discussion. But I'll give it this a quick intro for, for any of those who um, aren't really super familiar with Dask. I am going to assume some uh, knowledge just kind of in like general uh, data science NLP work uh, within Python specifically. So this is a specific uh, Python tool that we're talking about. Um, so the concept of it is parallel computing, but it differs from some other parallel computing libraries because it was built specifically to extend the PyData and Python data science ecosystem um, being born out of uh, Anaconda. It was called Continuum Analytics at the time, but if you use Conda environments, um, you know, the, the package manager, it was that company uh, who had, who they kind of sponsor a lot of open source work. And Dask was one of those projects that was kind of born at Anaconda, built completely open source uh, and supported by them 
at the beginning. But the main idea was that it was that same problem of Python stuff just taking too long or not being able to work with large data sets. There needed to be a way to kind of access multiple cores on a single machine or to access uh, multiple machines. But the, the key was that it needed to stay interactive with the existing kind of tool chain rather than having to kind of migrate over to a completely new tool. Um, Dask works with the existing packages. And there's actually, if you look around, there's a lot of packages that are built using Dask under the hood. So if you click this dask.org link, you'll, you'll see that there's a section for powered by Dask, but some key um, projects that use Dask are X-Array. Um, Prefect is a uh, kind of orchestration pipeline that uses Dask uh, under the hood. And then there's kind of several other projects that kind of rely specific on Dask. And then, you know, people can build a lot on top of it. So it works on your laptop. It'll use all of the cores that are on your machine. You know, my machine has six cores, or it'll scale up to having like hundreds of computers uh, in the cloud. And so the key part and the way that I kind of think about it is generally, if there's something that you're doing in Python that's slow or might take a long time, you can probably make it faster with Dask. But not only that, it probably won't take that much code rewrite. And that's kind of exactly what happened in this particular use case is that there was a big amount of a large amount of data and uh, Spacey was taking quite a while. And then we kind of threw Dask in and it was able to paralyze the work. And you'll see more about that uh, in a few minutes. So as far as like, what does Dask specifically do? Um, I have here is a list of just like several of the like high level high level interfaces that Dask works with. So Dask has a machine learning library which looks and feels like scikit-learn it actually works and integrates with scikit-learn. Um, but again, it's parallel across multiple machines. Uh, it'll do parallel data frames. It'll do parallel arrays. And then it'll parallelize basically anything else that you might need. And that's really where the huge value of Dask comes in is because it's built with this kind of low level idea in mind that you can parallelize pretty much any arbitrary Python function or sequence of functions that you might want to do. Um, and then these other higher level libraries are built on top of it. But there's a couple of graphs, uh, a couple of images here that I think might help to, to kind of make more sense about what, what Dask does. So starting again from more of the high level interfaces for the arrays and data frames, um, a Dask array is essentially a logical collection of NumPy arrays. So the way that this parallelization happens is like you have some giant array that won't fit in memory on one computer. Um, you'll just spread those arrays across multiple computers. So the individual kind of chunks and the individual pieces of a Dask array are still actually NumPy arrays that are kind of familiar and, and, and uh, to work with. Um, and then the Dask array package has an interface that's just like the NumPy array. The only difference is that Dask is translating those instructions into parallel computing. So in that case, the, the developer, the data scientist doesn't actually have to think about the fact that I have multiple chunks on different machines. How, what do I do when I'm trying to add things up? You just work with it the same way you would work with NumPy and then it, Dask kind of handles all of that task orchestration. Same thing goes for data frames. A Dask data frame is a collection of pandas data frames. And that's specifically uh, what we're using uh, in this particular use case as well is just like a large Dask data frame with sentences and then we're kind of extracting entities from there. So going, going back to the lower level interface and the, where this is really where Dask, again, this is like the key like core of Dask and where there's a lot of value and not only then, okay, I have a big data frame, I need to load it with a Dask data frame, but also inevitably you're gonna have some sort of custom computation. You're gonna have some other code that you would need to run that maybe doesn't fit well into a data frame context. In that case, you can actually use this Dask delayed wrapper and build up a graph of tasks by calling a function against other functions and Dask actually keeps track of all that work. So I don't have the time to go specifically into like how this works, but this is really the building block. And then all of the high level interfaces um, are built on top of that. And so th this is these screenshots are all taken from the Dask documentation if you go to dask.org. But this GIF is a, is a visualization, I believe of a, a grid search, like a hyperparameter search that was executed. So you can see at the bottom, you know, you start maybe with some cross validation and there's like a bunch of models that can train in parallel. And so Dask figures out which tasks can happen in parallel, which tasks are dependent on other tasks. And then it figures out kind of how to optimize the execution and order of all of that stuff. And then it gives you back the result at the end. But probably all that somebody did writing the code for this graph to execute was grid search.fit. Um, 
So again, the high level interfaces are really simple. Under the hood is taking care of a lot of work. So I know I'm breezing through this. If, if there's like, if you're like really inspired about Dask specifically and you really want to get into like, you know, some of more introduction into what Dask is, um, there's a talk here that I gave a few months ago, um, but we at Saturn Cloud actually do offer uh, workshops as well uh, for Dask. So if you're interested in attending one of those, we do them on several different topics like machine learning or data frames or deep learning. Um, feel free to reach out to me um, either through Twitter or find me on LinkedIn because uh, we can make sure that you get an invite to one of those workshops. Okay, so when, whenever I'm talking about like parallel computing, especially when we introduce Dask, there's always this kind of question of Spark because Spark is a cluster computing tool that has been around for several years. It was made probably, you know, four or five years before Dask was, and it's popular and used widely in a lot of spaces. So I always try to make sure to give some context and talk about like Spark versus Dask when you might use one, when you might not, or even just information about so you can make kind of your own decisions. Um, some history about Spark is it was a, a cluster computing tool that was built kind of post Hadoop, if you're familiar with the kind of like big data or data warehousing world. Um, it was kind of built within that ecosystem. So it's written in Scala, which means it executes in uh, the JVM with Java under the hood. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, if you're somebody who's more fam uh, familiar and comfortable with Python completely, um, Dask might be a better choice. But it does, Spark does have a Python API, it's just under the hood, it executes in Scala, so you might get some, some weird errors. And I think the, the main differences, again, are partially in the origins and the communities that the tools were built to serve. Uh, Spark was kind of like an all-in-one tool that was built primarily for like data engineering workloads. Um, so if you have some code that's already written in like scikit-learn or pandas or whatever, you kind of have to rewrite all of that stuff um, into Spark. Um, and then also one big drawback for Spark is that the its programming model isn't really suited for certain types of complex operations because it was built kind of in this map reduce paradigm. So things like multi-dimensional arrays and certain types of machine learning uh, either don't work or don't work very well just because of Spark's programming model. And so Dask, again, all, all the stuff that I talked about already, it was kind of built for the kind of pi data scientific computing world and it parallelizes all of those things, data frames, machine learning and such. Um, and then I don't really have time to talk about the tool listed on the bottom right, but if you wanna do some more research on, on it yourself, it's a really exciting project uh, called RAPIDS, which um, kind of accelerates data science workloads on the GPU. So not just deep learning like TensorFlow and PyTorch do, but it'll actually do like data frames, arrays, machine learning on the GPUs and then RAPIDS again, like as a native integration uses Dask to scale to multiple GPUs because, you know, GPUs only have so much memory in them. And so you'll need multiple if you want larger data sizes. Okay, um, so as just a quick example for um, what some Dask code might look like, this is again, just like a really, really quick example using just, you know, loading a data frame and then doing some splitting and model training. but. The key, you know, I won't go through every line here, but the key thing to see from this is that it looks a lot like regular data science code that you might write within Python. Maybe instead of importing scikit-learn or pandas, I'm importing a Dask library, but the interface looks really exactly the same. The train test split has the same interface, uh, the pipelines uh, and things like that. And then kind of, so that's really the, the entire theme of when you're working with Dask, either arrays or data frames or machine learning, it's that kind of uh, very, very good parity to the PyData ecosystem. Okay, so, you know, not only the like open source package, right? So it's like Dask is a tool, the code is out there, you can go take that code and it can scale to clusters, right? The problem is, is well, how do I even get a cluster in the first place? Um, the one thing is, is that Dask will work really well on your laptop. So if you just have, if you're slightly running out of the bounds of your machine, you can probably just use Dask on your computer and it'll kind of like distribute things across your cores. But if you really have start to get a larger, uh, bigger data sets, you would have to go to multiple machines. And that's where it can get challenging as someone who maybe doesn't have all the resources to have a data center or run the, run the kind of the cloud stuff yourself. So Dask has a lot of options for that. And I think this is again, reflective of the community and, and that Dask was built for. It was built to kind of run in a lot of different places in academic, scientific settings and such. Um, and so there's a lot of options for deploying Dask, right? Um, because there's all kinds of different, you know, kind of hardware infrastructure type setups. 
Um, so if you, I mean, the reason I show this screen is that if you have one of these things and you will know if you have one of these things because you're probably working with them, right? So like if you work in a high performance computing setting and you know what SLRM or, or SGE is like or MPI, you're working with that in your organization, you can run Dask right on there. Dask open source has integration with those and you can run it. Or if you have an existing Hadoop cluster in Yarn, you can kind of get those things working. Now what's pretty cool too with Dask is it actually has open source packages for working directly with cloud providers like AWS and Azure. So you could actually kind of like configure your AWS credentials and then the open source Dask will actually be able to launch a cluster. But um, there's still a lot of challenges there because then you know you either have to have the full keys to your AWS or cloud account, or you kind of still have to understand a lot of those underlying DevOps infrastructure type things. And so that's kind of where now you start to get into the commercial enterprise space. Uh, it was a similar story with like Spark and Databricks, and and so you know with Dask is an open source project, and so that's kind of where we at Saturn Cloud come in is that we offer kind of like an enterprise deployment. So that way, you know, even beyond these kinds of, you know, options for launching clusters, we'll make it like really, really easy for people to get up and go. Um, and so the kind of that's where Saturn Cloud comes in. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, of course, but the idea is that we're kind of this platform where people can come in, uh, do their Python data science work, um, and then scale it up with Dask and Rapids. And so this particular project with the uh, Core 19 kind of size spacey project was executed on Saturn Cloud using Dask for the parallelization. Um, and so that's kind of the idea. We have a couple of different um, offerings where you can kind of come in. If you don't have a cloud interface, you can you know go to a Saturn Cloud.io, start up running. We have examples and we run our workshops on that platform. But if you need some more enterprise security, we'll do a, a, a separate dedicated install into um, your AWS account. And so as far as like kind of like, you know, what you, how you would kind of work with it is like, we kind of offer the scaffolding and infrastructure for your kind of hardware resources. So you got, you create a project, you're doing your work within Jupyter lab from a Jupyter server, and that is tied to some specific hardware. And then you can attach a Dask cluster to kind of scale up, excuse me, and scale out your work. And so that's kind of where a lot of the stuff that we manage under the hood is that, and then you can kind of go out and deploy your work later. So another quick code example, um, if you've used Dask before, you'll see that the typical pattern for like in your code of accessing a Dask cluster is by initializing some sort of cluster object and then starting up a client. And so this is an example of the code that you would use to kind of launch up a Dask cluster and connect to the client uh, from within Saturn Cloud. If you're using a different, um, or maybe one of the open source cloud deployments, this first line where your import is importing Saturn cluster and then the Saturn cluster object creation, uh, that would change. You know, it would be a Yarn cluster or Kubernetes cluster or the AWS. Um, but then the cool thing, and again, a really cool thing about Dask is now once you have this client object, Dask itself knows it's working with Dask. All of the hardware infrastructure is kind of already abstracted away. So then any of that code you write will work with kind of like any sort of uh, Dask kind of infrastructure setup. Um, so I just want to take a peek at the questions because I then maybe if there's any specific uh, Dask questions, I can uh, answer them quickly now, and then otherwise I'll just pass it off to Sujit to talk. You know, a lot more about the specific uh, use case. Um, you do have two in the Q and A. Okay. I see, okay. Great. I see them here. Um, okay. So well, the first one is for what types of tasks uh, would you pick Spark? Um, I I would say. I'll say, first of all, like I'm a little biased because my company is the company is a company that's working on Dask and, and pushing Dask, but I use Spark for, for years um, and I, I really got to, to, to use it a lot. I use it mainly again in like these kind of like maybe data frame SQL oriented type uh, contexts. Um, and this is speaking from kind of my own uh, personal experiences that I tend to, you know, you know, I was using Spark, did a lot of those kind of like transformation SQL data frame type stuff. But then anytime I needed to kind of do machine learning, I would always end up dropping back to the PyData ecosystem because of the richer ecosystem of tools that it had. Um, and so that's kind of, that's, and then that's kind of the reason to, for me then to drift over into Dask um, because I tend to, you know, I'm doing a lot more uh, of that work there. Um, the next question here is, um, can you, uh, talking about Dask and Ray, um, 
And so, so there's actually a good thread. Like I, you might even be able to like Google Dask and Ray because there was a good GitHub thread where the founders of Dask and Ray were kind of both comparing and contrasting the different tools. I actually gave a talk uh, for the PyData Global Conference last month where I went through all of these different tools. So I went through Spark, Dask, Ray, Rapids, and did like a compare and contrast, gave my opinions on them. So if you wanna kind of look that up, uh, again, reach out to me. I believe they're posting the videos for PyData uh, next month. So you'll be able to kind of watch that talk again, but I can share the slides with you. The, the brief answer is that the core uh, mechanisms, uh, there's a couple of differences in the core mechanisms of, of Dask and Ray. They're both kind of this low level uh, task orchestration parallelization uh, frameworks. So from that perspective, they're similar. Um, Dask and Ray uh, have different um, opinions on uh, like orchestrating and scheduling. So Dask is kind of a central schedule, centrally scheduled type uh, parallel orchestration tool, whereas Ray is a uh, like each of the uh, kind of like workers contribute towards kind of the scheduling orchestration. I'm not explaining that in the best way, um, but basically it's kind of like that kind of like top down or, or kind of bottom spread uh, scheduling. Um, and then the, I think the, the larger differences though are again, like the communities that they were born and built for, I guess. Um, Ray, it seems like it was built a lot for kind of um, distributing some deep learning tasks. Uh, they have a library for reinforcement learning. They have uh, several libraries. Uh, really all of their applications currently are kind of centered around deep learning. Uh, whereas Dask was built um, for the kind of, again, like the broader scientific PyData ecosystem. So data frames, arrays, machine learning, and then kind of any other tasks that you might do from like the kind of high level uh, interfaces and, and integrations. Again, there's a lot more that I could talk to about that. Like if, if you want to check out the PyData talk, you, you can definitely do that, but I can't spend all that much time here. Um, sorry, another can, question. Um, sorry. can you stop sharing that way I can start? while you yes. answer the questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Um, so there's one more question here and I'll oh, actually, I got to double check the, the chat to make sure that it wasn't there. Um, one question here is how industrialized is Dask or how production ready is Dask? And I'll say the Dask is, is pretty, is production ready. Like um, there's actually a good page on the Dask um, documentation. Actually what that specific question is like, is, you know, Dask production ready and there's a lot of considerations there kind of outlining all the different points and reasons of why it is um, I think one really encouraging and one one very key um, I guess evidence of the fact that it is uh, kind of production ready and isn't being industrialized is the fact that you're seeing uh, enterprise companies like Saturn Cloud being born and built up around enterprise support. So that's similar to things that you saw back in the day for Hadoop, like Hortonworks and Cloudera, like what you saw in the past with Spark and Databricks. And then there's several companies, Saturn Cloud being one of them, that are currently in the space of um, building enterprise solutions for Dask. And I think that's kind of the biggest tell of how that people are using it uh, uh, in, in kind of production settings. Um, and then let me just double check. Yeah, we, uh, so George Zipperlin, I enabled you to talk to ask your question. Okay, yeah, this might be in the uh, Pi Data talk, which I'll look at. But uh, how does this play with like a, using local GPUs with something like CUDA? Yeah, th that's a great question. So um, I' I'm not sure if that's specifically in the talk. I in the Pi Data talk, I do talk about GPUs, Dask, and Rapids. But as far as like specifically the consideration for local. Um, it's it, Dask will actually work to uh, parallelize that kind of work. So let's say you have four GPUs uh, like on your machine, um, you can orchestrate tasks and work across those using Dask. So you're not you're not really just stuck on one GPU. And a, and a good example of that is the Rapids library. Um, and there's this um, Dask CUDA package where you can initialize what's called like a local CUDA cluster which means it's not a distributed cluster of different machines, but it's just on your, your, on your single machine, you can create like this cluster where the GPUs are kind of the workers. Um, and I can try to find an example while also just talking it and, and put a link in the chat for that. Thank you. No problem. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start then. So, yes. um, so I'm going to cover the application behind the blog post that Aaron mentioned earlier in the talk today. 
So essentially it's a pipeline to extract biomedical named entities from the COVID-19 data set uh, using pre-trained models from SciSpacey and the DAS-based uh, distributed computing platform from Sun Cloud. So um, this project, like uh, probably many in 2020, has its origins around the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, around the time the pandemic became official, Elsevier launched its own initiative against it and invited its employees to dedicate their skills to help fight the pandemic as well. Uh, and there was considerable uptake uh, among the employees uh, as a result. One of the initiatives was the COVID KG project, uh, an attempt to build a knowledge graph around the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus and COVID-19, the disease. Um, my initial effort was geared around this. And the first step was to identify the entities that would form the subject and object of such uh, relationship triples. Meanwhile, uh, Allen AI had uh, released the COVID-19 dataset, a collection of uh, scholarly articles around COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 and related coronaviruses uh, that was increasingly being used as the research, by the research community as the baseline dataset. And another package I was looking around at the time was SciSpacey, a collection of Spacey models trained on scientific content, mostly biomedical content, uh, for various tasks, among them various named entity recognition or NER models. And while, and so, so, and while I had done some initial work for identifying entities using Dask on a local EC2 box, uh, I was hitting its limits. So uh, in the meantime, Saturn Cloud offered us an opportunity to evaluate their platform, and I proposed this project to them. Uh, this allowed me to move my processing from multiple processes on a single machine to multiple workers across a cluster of machines, right? So obviously much uh, uh, better, you know, resource-wise. Uh, so, and, you know, really for existing code, uh, about the only change I had to make was switching from the default single machine desk scheduler that I was using to the Saturn distributed scheduler. So, you know, code change was like really, really minimal. I also ended up dropping several custom hacks I was doing uh, in order to bypass the resource limitations. Um, so I ended up with a much simpler pipeline that directly you know, used the DAS parallelism and wrote to parquet files. And I can say this with confidence that had it not been for the Saturn Cloud Platform and Aaron and others uh, in their tech support team, uh, this project would have taken much longer to complete, definitely. Um, so here with the goals of this project, First, the idea was to create uh, standoff annotations, um, basically entity data extracted from the text into a tabular format um, with pointers back into the text, right? So it, it, as character offsets. Also, these uh, annotations were on the entirety of the COD19 dataset, unlike many pipelines where you annotate only what you need uh, for the current experiment. The pipeline was inspired by an internal pipeline uh, developed by our labs team called CAT or Content Analytics Toolbench. Um, the second thing that we wanted to do was uh, that to ensure a quick turnaround, we made the decision to use uh, pre-trained models to annotate our content rather than train them on our own first. And uh, so third, the hope was that the process would output annotations in a format that would be accessible to more than just desk. Even though it was on desk, we are actually long time uh, Spark users. So we wanted the output to be readable by Spark as well. So, uh, so we chose Spark A, a standard format accessible from both Desk and Spark and suitable for large data volumes. And fourth, um, there was a sense that the output of the process was ultimately going to be more interesting and useful than the process itself. And that since the input data set and the train models were both in the public domain, it just made sense to put the output in the public domain as well, right? So, uh, so I already talked a bit uh, about the COD19 dataset earlier, that it was released by Allen AI in collaboration with uh, some other entities in government and industry. Um, the intent was to facilitate research into COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The dataset consists of scholarly articles around COVID-19 from public archives such as PubMed, uh, Central, Medline, BioArchive, MedArchive, and the World Health Organization as well as commercial publishers uh, of scholarly content, uh, such as uh, Elsevier, uh, Springer, Wiley, et cetera. The COD19 dataset uh, started out at around like 40,000 articles in a weekly release schedule. So fairly small at that point. 
Since then, the pace of research into COVID-19 has continued to grow. And at the time the project was built, there were around 200,000 articles and the release schedule had changed daily. And each release uh, contains uh, a metadata.csv file uh, containing IDs, title, abstract, and the file path to the full text when available. Um, the full text of the scholarly article is contained as uh, JSON files. So there were approximately 200,000 JSON files also in my case, since uh, the size of the data set was 200,000. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was the SciSpacy library. So SciSpacy leverages the open source uh, NLP library Spacy that most of uh, you know most people have heard of, and it adds several language models trained on biomedical data. So these language models are trained to do the standard stuff: tokenization, sentence splitting, border speech tagging, phrase chunking, etc. Um, in addition to the language models, SciSpacy comes with uh, four named entity recognition or NER models trained against popular biomedical data sets. And you can see them here on, on the right, on the top right. Um, and as you can see, if you look at the F1 scores, the F1 scores are respectable. They're not great, but 70 to 80% range. Um, and it also shows you what kind of entities it recognizes, each of these models, right, under, uh, under the entity types. And um, the other thing to note, SciSpacy also supports five name entity recognition and linking or NERL models. Uh, in these models, the task of identifying the entity span is carried out with a basic language model, or, you know, the English model or whatever language it is. And then linking of the entity span that it identifies to a node in the next external taxonomy is done using a trained entity linker. So each of these uh, taxonomies would have a trained entity linker associated with it. So uh, SciSpacy supports uh, linking entities to the Unified Medical Language System, the UMLS, Medical uh, Subject Headings, or MESH, uh, the Human Phenotype Ontology, or HPO, Gene Ontology, or GO, and RxNorm and Ontology of Drugs. The logos are down at the bottom for these. And here is basically you know, an overview of the full pipeline for the process. The boxes represent steps. And they are basically modeled as Jupyter notebooks. Uh, input to the pipeline is the metadata.csv file and the JSON files from Code 19. The 01 notebook uh, parses this input into a Parquet dataset of paragraphs. The 02 notebook reads this dataset of paragraphs and uses the SciSpacy sentence splitter to, excuse me, split them into a dataset of sentences. And the 03 notebooks, there is a series of them uh, corresponding uh, to the four NER models. Um, they each wrap the NER models, uh, the corresponding NER model, to produce a data set of entity annotations uh, from that model using the sentence data set as input. And similarly, the 04 notebooks, and there are five of them here, uh, each wrap one of the five NERL models to produce a data set of entity annotations from that model, again, from the uh, sentence data set, right? So as you can see, each of these steps are embarrassingly parallel and quite well suited for something like desk. Okay. So, uh, so here, so in in the four uh, slides uh, following, I will uh, describe each step in slightly greater detail. So all this all this code is available in Jupyter notebooks in a public GitHub repository, and the extract entity, the extracted entities are available in a public AWS S3 dataset bucket. Um, in addition, even though each step is embarrassingly parallel on its own, there are different, slightly different shades of embarrassingly parallel. And I will describe the challenges that we were, uh, we faced for each variance and how we overcame them. For the zero one step, uh, generating paragraphs in the metadata CSV and the JSON files, uh, the, you know, we actually have a perfectly parallel case in the sense that each file has zero dependencies with the others. So from an NLP point of view, metadata.csv file was used. You read the row, uh, get the data, pull out the article file, parse the JSON. So, and it's, it, all the articles were in JSON format. So parsing is pretty straightforward. And you can see this being done in the parse paragraphs uh, module here. Um, and essentially we just apply the uh, parse paragraph to each row of the um, data set. And um, this will return, um, it parses the JSON file and returns an array of paragraph ID and text tuples, which we then explode and then we write, uh, we write it out to the, uh, the paragraph uh, dataset, right? Uh, the parquet file of paragraphs. 
And so let's go to the next one. Um, so the, the zero two step is basically splitting paragraphs to sentences, right? Also embarrassingly parallel. And uh, because there is no inter-paragraph dependency. However, we do have to instantiate a relatively heavyweight uh, language model to do the sentence splitting. And as you can see from the code, we assign this lazily once per partition using the map partitions call uh, down here on the first sentence in the main, right? Um, and the map partition call allows you to define actions at a partition level and is good for setting up and tearing down uh, relatively heavyweight objects per partition as we have done here. Uh, similarly, a similar functionality exists for Spark as well and probably other uh, distributed computing environments as well. Uh, on the NLP side, and as a general practice to keep the model as lightweight as possible, um, it actually makes sense to, Spacey gives you certain uh, features to um, strip down the model, right? So, and we have done that here, we have used that using the disable um, um, uh, parameter uh, where we have disabled the tagger and the NER modules because all we need is a sentence splitter here, right? So we keep uh, the model lightweight in that sense. And uh, that, so that's one of the tricks we used uh, in this particular one, right? And so in the next case, uh, where we go from um, sentences to entities using the NER models. So this is our third flavor of embarrassingly parallel. Uh, like the sentence splitter model, uh, NER models also tend to be relatively heavyweight and expensive to instantiate per sentence. Uh, so once again, we use map partitions to assign the model lazily per partition. Uh, in addition, uh, Spacey offers a way to do multi-threaded inference using the nlp.pipe call. And we have used that here. So um, essentially uh, we, we um, do the, and so if you notice here, the NLP, so in the handle batch, if you look at the NLP pipe, so this, this basically takes a batch of sentences and it allows, uh, you know, so, and spreads the sentences across all the threads that it has, you know, if you, if you start it up with a multi, you know, multiple threads, uh, it will spread it across all its uh, workers, worker threads. And uh, so that is another trick that we use here to make it a uh, little, um, you know, faster. And finally, um, we have the sentences to the entities with the NERL models, right? So here our um, issue is actually further, uh, you know, we have more issues here, right? Because uh, the, not only are we just using one NER model, we have to instantiate a language model and an entity linker model. So, you know, very, very heavyweight. And we found that, uh, you know, using our standard uh, practice of lazy loading per partition, we consistently got out of memory errors. And so this, this actually stumped, up for a while, stumped us for a while until Aaron actually figured it out. Solution was to switch to eager loading once per worker. And you can see this happening in the code here. So as you um, instantiate the client and you know, from the cluster, immediately you run initialize workers on them. So it's like the moment the cluster is started, all the workers get to initialize their workers and that remains for the life of the, the processing. And that actually uh, you know, allowed us to get past the um, out of memory errors. So, um, so, so far we have talked about the full pipeline and uh, you know, which is what you would use starting from just a core 19 data set. However, if you already had entities and other outputs from a previous run, it's actually much, much faster to only process the diffs and merge the results, right? So by, much fast, by diffs, uh, basically the papers which were added since the last uh, time you ran core 19 and the papers that were deleted, right? So it's actually quite easy to find uh, the diffs, uh, compute the diffs, uh, from the metadata CSV file. And so then you just run the pipeline to uh, run only on the added articles, uh, merge it back with the previous output and delete the outputs from the deleted articles, right? And um, by, by uh, reducing the processing time, it actually goes from six to eight hours uh, in the first case to under 30 minutes, like more like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, you can get this entire thing done, right? So it's actually a big uh, help if you can do, you know, if you do incremental and over time, of course, you would have to do uh, folds once in a while because uh, you might have, you know, changes which don't get uh, accommodated. Um, so either from either pipeline, uh, the outputs are the same. 
uh, it's a paragraph data set, the sentence data set, and the various entity data sets from each of the different NER and NERL models. And as you can see, the output formats here uh, reflect the hierarchical nature of the data. So a paragraph contains multiple sentences, each of which contains multiple entities. And uh, you can see that the foreign keys, uh, cord ID, UID, PID, and SID are repeated. And basically they point back from the child to the parent. So um, it's actually easy to run analysis at a sentence level or a paragraph level or a document level, you know, using these uh, back pointers. And just to give you an idea of the volume, the output from the September uh, 28, 2020 version of Cord 19 that we used has uh, 3.4 million paragraphs, 17.1 uh, million sentences, and 805.4 uh, million entities um, from the nine different NER and NERL models. Um, so one, as you would recall from the goals uh, section, one of our uh, goals was that the output should be accessible from Spark as well since that is currently a distributed computing platform. So I found out the hard way um, that Spark actually cannot infer column types correctly from Parquet files written by desk. So you need to explicitly specify the column types on the desk side, right? So, um, so that is one. And the second, the, the second thing that we uh, noticed was that when you read it from Spark, you will actually see a bunch of uh, hidden columns uh, which uh, Das wrote out, it's columns with an underscore. So on the Spark side, you would have to run a select like the one shown in the screenshot here, where you only restrict yourself to um, the columns that, uh, you know, the columns that you need, right? And finally, uh, there is also, I think, uh, there, there may be a need to do an explicit repartitioning of the data frame on the Das side before writing it out to Parquet. Um, Although, I mean, all these are good, um, you know, best practices to do, um, but you would have to, uh, you know, kind of remember to do them uh, in each case, right? So in any case, we are able to make our desk, desk output uh, readable by Spark as well. So the data sets can be consumed either by Spark or by desk at this point. Um, so to reiterate, uh, here are the deliverables for the project first. Uh, the code to implement both the full and the incremental pipelines are shared under an Apache 2.0 license via the GitHub repository shown here. Uh, so you can actually build your own data set of entities from a recent version of Code 19, if you wish. Uh, notebooks are uh, saved with cell outputs in this uh, GitHub. So they're, they're kind of self-describing. Um, second, the, the output of the pipeline is shared with the community. Um, using a requester pays S3 bucket. So with requester pays, you only pay the network charges to download the data, uh, which we calculated to be between three to $10, depending on your usage volume. Also, if you end up using the data set for some academic research and need to cite the data set, it is also available via Mendeley data sets. And you can see the citation information here on the right, uh, the, and including the DOI. So the DOI is, oops, sorry. The DOI is right here. Uh, in case you need to cite it. And so as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the output, the, the utility of the output um, is actually, you can have, you know, uh, one, one uh, possibility is to generate micro data sets for specific NLP tasks using some kind of data frame or SQL based API, maybe to answer questions like, the, like those shown here. Um, the entity annotations could also be used as features for topic modeling or text categorization tasks. And, you know, however, this is just a partial list. Uh, and, you know, from my viewpoint, I suspect that many of you would be able to come up with far better use cases than for this data set than I can. And so that's all I had today. Thank you all for listening. And we can take questions now if uh, there are any. I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, Suchit and Aaron, you have a couple of questions in the Q&A. And if uh, people would like to ask your questions live, use the raise hand feature and I will unmute you in order to ask your own question. Um, so uh, Jack uh, Park asks, curious about dealing with imperfections in the JSON COVID files. Hi, Jack, uh, nice meeting you again. Uh, we have met before, so, you know, this kind of, um, uh, I actually ran through it and I didn't see any imperfections. 
Um, I was uh, not, you know, to be honest, what I was doing was uh, I was uh, taking the abstract. Um, if if the abstract uh, happened in the was available in the metadata.csv file, I wouldn't read the abstract uh, from the JSON file, but uh, I would read the body, um, you know, paragraphs from there. And uh, that's all I was doing. I did not do any further uh, parsing. So I did not see any. Uh, did you? I'm not sure if you actually saw any. Um, but we, we can, um, you know, kind of uh, talk offline if you wish uh, about this. Or, you know, further down, uh, we could uh, kind of go through this. How big was the cluster? Does it run straight as a K, team, a K cluster or EC2? Or does I, it use I, I enable Sorry. Jack to speak if he wishes okay. to follow up okay. a question. Okay. Hi, Jack. Hi, Sujit. Um, I did download the COVID docs and ran my own little toy parser on it and, and stumbled on a lot of areas where uh, they had, I, it looked like the parens were not where they belonged. It looked like numbers were not formatted right. If you, there were little odds and ends that ah, okay. seemed to show up. And, and that was what I was curious about. It's probably not crucial, but if you're trying to be a perfectionist in, in, yes. in doing this harvesting, you, you, you stumble. That, I'll, I'll, I'll mute now. Thank you, Sujit. No, I, I uh, yeah, I noticed that too. Uh, at this, well, at the level at which I was using the JSON parser, I was just getting the body in bulk. Uh, however, I did notice uh, things uh, like you pointed out, where there were you know misplaced paragraphs, or uh, but uh, those were uh, during sentence splitting. So I ended up having sentences with uh, um, some sentences were not very meaningful, right? Because of that. Uh, I kind of chopped it down to, uh, you know, just bad data. And, you know, because I had so much of it, um, I did not really care about the bad data. So that was, uh, you know, not, not a perfect uh, answer, I guess, but that was my approach to it. Um, so how big was the cluster? I'm going to the next uh, thing. Does it run straight as a K18 cluster on EC2, or does it use any AWS native orchestrators like ECS? Um, all this was uh, actually hidden from me under the Saturn uh, cloud cluster. Um, I did end up uh, cleaning up. So these were um, Kubernetes clusters in the back uh, on um, EC2. Yeah, and I can talk to a little more of the details uh, if you like, Sujit. I don't. I actually don't remember how big the cluster was. We can probably go look in the code. Um, would say specifically, but yeah. So, so behind the scenes, the nodes in the cluster are EC2 instances. So you would say, like, you know, I want a machine, um, you know, two x large or whatever that has like 64 gigs of RAM and eight cores, or I want a machine that has a GPU. And then behind the scenes, they are uh, EC2 instances. As far as like the orchestration of how it works with Dask, yeah, we use Kubernetes. Uh, under the hood, and then we kind of have our own kind of like custom built stuff orchestrated in there. I believe the um, the Dask cloud provider, like the open source AWS connection, uses uh, ECS and Fargate. Um, the challenge with I think specifically Fargate is that you can't use um, like GPU machines with the Fargate cluster. Um, so you know that's kind of some of the, so getting into some of those hairy details is like part of why we kind of like kind of built our own thing on top of it and then offer it. Uh, for people to use, but basically from the Saturn UI, you just say, I want this cluster at this size with this many nodes. Um, and then behind the scenes, we kind of abstract that stuff. Yeah, we the, on, regarding the cluster size, uh, we used a 10 node cluster. Um, and each of the nodes was like, I think, 4x, the 4x size, whatever that was. Okay, so, so that's 16 nodes, 16 CPUs, right? Each? Yeah, 16 CPUs, 128 gigs of RAM. Um, looks like another Saturn question. Um, is Saturn Cloud similar to AWS SageMaker? So um, comparing and contrasting some of those, I think there's things like uh, like a Jupyter Lab interface that both tools offer. Um, the key differentiator with Saturn is that we offer these kind of managed Dask clusters and we offer a kind of like, like all-in-one deployment package, which is something like, especially like the Dask cluster part um, is not available with SageMaker. And then the deployments are kind of like all kind of more tied together seamlessly. Um, and in my opinion, <laughs> Saturn Cloud is kind of this like all-in-one kind of 
web interface you go into, you see where all of your stuff is, you see all of your projects and your resources, and you can kind of manage it all within there. Sometimes when you're using SageMaker, some permissions can get weird and like you have to have like an AWS account and then you have to kind of like figure out kind of like all of that stuff. Um, so those are some of the considerations. I, again, if you want to talk more detail, we can chat on the, the Saturn Cloud uh, Slack. Uh, I put in the link there um, again, because that this conversation could probably go uh, really deep, but that's the high level. Let me, uh, let me say again, if you have a question, raise your hand if you want to be voice enabled or put it in the Q&A. And let me address a question to you, Sujit. Uh, this is not a technology question. Uh, what's been learned via this work about COVID-19? Do you have a sense of uh, uh, what kind of outcomes there have been? Well, the, the, at least for this uh, project, this is like a piece of the uh, pipeline. So the idea was to create like a, you know, like a repository where we could uh, then, you know, query uh, using uh, data frame like tools. Um, so we basically created like a substrate for further research. Um, we have been doing um, some work on relationship extraction on top of this. Um, and uh, we've also been doing some un well, unrelated NLP work, not, not truly around uh, this, but uh, the, the, the using the idea that you know, now we have you know, medical sentences with entities identified uh, can we do uh, something more with them? Can we build classifiers that, um, you know, can say that given a pair of entities, does the sentence assert anything between the entities, right? So, so that is uh, one uh, avenue that we have been going at. at uh, but mainly this was built for relationship extraction. And uh, yeah, so uh, also you could do it for the micro data sets. We have been looking at uh, doing some um, you know, sentence similarity work and followed by question answering uh, to identify, you know, given a medical question, uh, can you um, find evidence in the text uh, to answer the question? So because uh, reading comprehension models are pretty well, you know, developed, sure. the hard part is actually finding the appropriate paragraphs to get the, you know, answer from, right? Um, so this, uh, so this kind of helps us in certain ways because we you know, broke it down into sentences and we were able to match against sentences. So yeah. it helps us in identifying the paragraphs. Yeah, there, there certainly has been uh, probably 15 years or more of experience applying uh, NLP for uh, relation extraction for pharmaceutical drug discovery and other biomedical applications like that. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, oh yes, there's one other. No, you already answered that, Aaron. Do we have any other questions for our speakers, for Sujit and Aaron? No. All right. Well, uh, thanks to everyone. I'm going to reshare my slide with my contact information. Uh, if you'd like to give a talk at a future meetup, please drop me a note. Or if you have any other questions or concerns uh, that you think I might be able to respond to. Uh, the video today will be posted probably within a few hours at the NLP XING channel on YouTube. And I want to thank our speakers, uh, Sujit Pal from Elsevier and Aaron Richter from Saturn Cloud, very much for giving a talk today. And thank you all for attending. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.